So we are in Waking Up Part 3, and this started two weeks ago. We started with Part 1, and it's based on, originally, Isaiah 52, verse 1. I'm going to read that. Awake, awake, O Zion, clothe yourself with strength. Put on your garments of splendor, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Now, what we have found is that in the church, there are a lot of folks who are alive, but they're asleep. And it's important. There's a numerous um, examples in the Gospels with parables talking about people who were not aware of what was going on and were asleep. You have the, uh, the situation with the ten brides, right? And they were sleeping when the bridegroom came. You have this situation where uh, the, the thief comes in the night because men were sleeping. The guards were sleeping. You have the situation where seeds were sown into a person's field, weeds, basically, in their field, while men slept, the Bible says. So the Bible's telling us that sleeping is not a good thing when it comes to your spirit, your spirit. Obviously, we all need sleep. We all need rest. Physically speaking, our bodies need rest, but your spirit is a whole nother thing. We need to be awake in our spirit. We need to be aware. If you missed last week's message, you can find that online. Uh, there's a video of that whole message at shorelinefullgospel.org or on our YouTube page, which is Shoreline Full Gospel. So I had been praying when this all began about a move of God's spirit. And that's what a lot of people will call revival in churches. And then the Lord spoke to me, and he said, a revival is bringing something back to life that has died. He says the church doesn't need to be coming back to life because it's not dead, but the church is asleep. And the church needs to be awakened. It needs to get up, as we saw in Isaiah, put on its clothes, prepare to go out and do the will of the Father in the field, we need to wake up and stir ourselves up. We need to rise up, and we need to do the work of him who sent, it while, sent us while it's day because the night comes when nobody can work. You know, right now, you're alive, and you're aware, and you're capable, and you functioned somehow enough to get here today, and you're able right now to do the work of the gospel, to do the work of God in your life. You're able to do the work. A day will come where we're not able to do the work. And what do I mean by that? Well, obviously, the day that we pass from this life to the next, our job here is finished. We retire, right? We retire, we go to heaven. We have a great retirement. But what did we do while we were here? The things that we can accomplish that matter for eternity are things we do here. What we do in eternity won't matter for what's going on here. You won't save any souls when you're up there in, with Jesus praising God with all the saints. You'll save souls while you're here. This is the place where you get to minister to people. This is the place where the need is. There is no need in heaven. There is no lack in heaven. But here we have lack. We have need. We have people who are lost. We have people who don't know Jesus and don't even know they don't know Jesus. Some people were born in a church where they sprinkled them on the head and said, you're saved, don't worry about it. You know? Um, <laughs> I remember uh, our friend Chris that greets he was telling me one time, he, kinda, he was born in a, a, a Lutheran family. He went to a Lutheran church. At that particular church, he uh, started to read the gospel, started to read the word of God, and started to realize maybe there's more to this than what they've been teaching here. And he talked to a Lutheran pastor, and he talked about salvation, about being born again. The Lutheran pastor said, well, infant baptism has always been good enough for me. That's it. Just baptize that child, and boom, you're in. You know, that's not enough. That's not enough. You see, when you're born, you aren't born, stillborn. That's being born dead. You're born alive, and when you're alive, you grow. And you not only grow, you do things, okay? You function in this world. And hopefully you function in a way that at the beginning might be rather selfish because children are kind of self-centered because it's all about them at first. But later on, you learn how to be about other people too. You learn how to give. You learn how to help. You learn how to be an uh, asset to the people around you and to the world you're in. We're not all just consumers, but we want to be people that are doing God's will. And when you're doing God's will, you know what? You're helping people. 
Now, helping people doesn't necessarily mean just, just handing out you know, bags of food. It doesn't just mean um, give them a pat on the back. But helping people also is this, is that every single person is born without a knowledge of God as far as salvation. They don't, they don't understand the plan of salvation until somebody at some point explains it. The Bible says it. It says, how can they hear unless it be preached to them? And how can it be preached to them unless a preacher be sent? So we have a message in us that people need to hear that they don't know if we don't tell them. And we go, wow, oh, you're talking about that stuff that takes me out of my comfort zone. I want you to know your comfort zone is your prison. That's what your comfort zone is. Your comfort zone has a wall. And when you get up to that wall, you go, that's as far as I can go. But God doesn't want you to have a comfort zone. He wants you to have no zone, just everything. It's all free. He wants you to be free. He doesn't want you to have walls. He doesn't want you to be imprisoned. He wants you to walk in freedom. And you go, but, but this liberty that Christ has me in, it's kind of scary. You know, freedom can be scary to a convict. Do you know that? There's some people who have been incarcerated for 20, 30 years, and getting out scares them to death because they're used to the order that's there. They're used to the confinement that says, I won't have any big surprises today. It'll just be like every other day. And so I know what to expect, so it's not scary. But when you're free, you go, I guess i got to find a place to live. I guess i got to find a job. i got to figure out how to eat. It's scary. Well, God wants you to step out of your prison, even if you're, you're used to your prison. Even if your prison has become comfortable, he wants you to walk free. And freedom, you might say, well, that's kind of scary. Well, I always say to people this. When we go out, for example, on Thursdays to pray for people, some people say, I'm really scared. And I say, no, you're not scared. You're excited. You're excited. You see, there's this tension that's in you, but it's not that, oh my gosh, we're going to go out there and terrible things are going to happen. It's this thing like, I don't know what's going to happen. It's the unknown. But you see, this is what it's like to walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is something where you have to abandon all that safe stuff and say, you know what? I'm going to trust Jesus. God's got me. And I'm going to take a step that's uncomfortable perhaps because I want to experience the fullness of what God has for me. I don't want to be stuck. I want to be free. I want to walk, and then I want to, after I walk for a while, I want to run. I want to run in the Spirit. I want to do the things of God that please God because this is where you're completely, completely satisfied in your life when you're in that center of God's will, when you know you're doing God's will, when there's nothing holding you back, when you say, I don't have a fear at all in this world because my hope is in Christ. My faith is in God. God wants us to be free. He wants us to be free, and some of us don't want to be free because free is scary. You know, if you're in prison, you know you're going to get three meals a day. You don't have to worry about it, right? You know you're going to have, uh, you know, a certain time that you uh, uh, will, will, will get, get new bedding for your bed. You'll, you'll get a new uniform for the prison. You know it's going to all be taken care of. Everything's taken care of. And that's what the devil wants you in prison, where it's so safe that you actually don't get to live. You just get to survive. You're just surviving, but not really living. Living Life has to do with being free, and God wants us free. So how do we get free? Well, you got to, first of all, hear God's word and respond to it. And this is what waking up's about, too. we got to wake up to where we're at. we got to wake up to where are we not free right now? we got to look around. You see, when it's night and it's dark, you may not be able to see your prison walls, but when you turn the lights on, you go, oh, there's a wall and there's bars. Now I get where I'm at, right? We need to wake up to where we're at right now in our spiritual walk. If you're not free, then you need to see the wall and see what it is. And you need to go to God about that thing and say, Lord, I don't want to be a prisoner. I want to walk free. I want to do your will. I want to be ready, instant in season and out, that whenever you call on me, I am ready to act. I'm ready to move. Lord, I don't want to feel like I have restrictions to my spiritual life. I want to grow. I want to grow. I want to flourish. I want to plant seeds that matter. I want to say and do things in this life that plant seeds for eternity. I want to plant seeds in people's hearts so that they can come and know Jesus. I want to plant seeds that will matter even when I'm gone. Even when I'm gone. How many things do we do that matter when we're gone? You know, it really doesn't matter in the big picture. Look at the really big picture. There's a small picture. The small picture is this life. The bigger picture is beyond this life. But the big picture is eternity. 
and in eternity, how many things you do right here will matter forever. You go, well, you know, I built a great big business. Maybe you're Bill Gates. I built Microsoft. That doesn't matter in eternity. I made billions of dollars. It doesn't matter in eternity. There's no need for money in heaven or hell, right? Well, I, I, uh, you know, I built great buildings and I, I conquered cities and, you know, and I, I took kingdoms. And none of that matters for eternity. What matters for eternity are the things that affect eternal beings, the things that affect the souls of men. That's what matters. What matters is what we do that makes a difference in people's spiritual lives. That's what really matters. How much of what we're doing is stuff that will last? You see, even the most beautiful things that you can find in the Louvre, you know, the museum in France, even the most beautiful things, and even the most uh, wonderful artifacts from ancient history that you can find in Rome, the Colosseum, and all these, all these things, do you know the day is coming, the Bible says, where it'll all be burnt up? All of it. You mean this precious treasure created by Michelangelo? Yes, it's going to be burnt up. You mean all of it? Even this painting, all of it, it'll all be gone someday. It says the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and God will create a new heaven and a new earth, and all that stuff will be gone, gone, gone. Where are you investing your life? Are you investing in something that has eternal benefit? You might say, Oh, this sermon makes me uncomfortable. I came to church today to be comforted. I want to tell you something. If it makes you uncomfortable, it's because there's a spirit in you that is dying to get out and do God's will. There's a spirit in you that wants to be pleasing to God. There's a spirit in you that doesn't want to be imprisoned any longer. That's what's making you uncomfortable. Your flesh is uncomfortable because your flesh says, I don't want to do anything. Your flesh is never going to get you further in the kingdom of God, ever. Your flesh, denying the flesh is something we must do. Jesus says, you've got to deny the flesh daily. You've got to pick up your cross daily. You go, I, but I don't want to do that. That's your flesh talking. And since when has your flesh led you in the right direction ever? Right? Your flesh did not lead you to Christ. It was the word of God that came to you, that penetrated your heart, that spoke to your spirit, to your soul, that said there's something more and I don't have it, but I want it. You see, God has something more for you that you don't have yet. You go, but I have something. You may have something, but he wants to give you more. You say, but I've got just more of the same, you mean? You know what? He might even want to give you something more that is not even just the same, but it's different as well. Because there's more out there for God to give you. There's more out there for God to, to put in your life that will make your life fuller. Because old song, you know, said it a hundred times, if maybe a thousand times, is one life will soon be passed. Only what you do for Christ will last. That's it. That's it. Oh, now I came here to be encouraged. I want to encourage you. You know what I encourage you of? This isn't the end of the road. You're not consigned to this cell, and this wall is yours restriction, and you're done. No, there's a world out there that's fabulous and fantastic that God has for you, the world of the spirit realm. He's inviting you. He's saying, it exists. This isn't all there is. There's more. There's much, much more. Oh, I think I've seen all I'm going to see in my life. There's much, much more. And God's calling you to say, come. Let him drink freely. Come to the waters of salvation and drink freely and see what I have for you. I have so much more for you. You know, the longer... This is an interesting thing. When you first get saved, you're all full up. And when you're really older, you're not all full up. You've got quite, maybe a half a tank, maybe a quarter tank, because you realize all the stuff you thought you knew, you realize now, you know, I really didn't know very much. I just, I know this much, and there's so much more. There's so much more that I could have in Christ. There's so much more I could do for Christ's kingdom. There's so much more I could do that actually matters. You know, everybody wants their life to matter. Nobody wants to feel like you were just a, a, a space taker on earth. You just took up some space. You consumed some goods, and you left, and you left nothing behind. Everybody wants to leave something behind that matters. And the things that you do for the kingdom of God are what really matters. But if you're asleep, you can be a perfectly good, normal Christian, filled with the Holy Spirit, 
with your heart set on making it to heaven and doing God's will. But if you're asleep, you're inactive. When you sleep, how much do you get done around the house? Think about it. When you sleep, how, how, how much are you working on your job while you're sleeping? You're probably not doing any of that, are you? When you sleep, what do you do? Well, uh, the very most you're going to be doing is maybe dream. And your dreams, are they tangible? Do they accomplish anything in this world? They actually don't accomplish anything. That's what happens to a lot of us. We're asleep because we're dreaming about stuff that won't even matter later on. Our minds are fixed on stuff. You see, Matt got a word when we were praying this morning, and his word was basically, put away all distractions. And then I heard David say pretty much the same words in a few moments later, and he didn't even hear Matt say it. Put away all the distractions. The distractions. In the book Pilgrim's Progress, it's a place called Vanity Fair. And Pilgrim is walking his walk. It's the Lord's walk. He's doing his journey to make it to the kingdom, but there's this distraction off to the side. It's a city that's got all the Ferris wheels and the bright lights and fun and games and stuff happening. And he's drawn to this thing because it's attractive. And what it is, it's all the vanity of all the stuff you do that really doesn't matter, that's actually a, quite a distraction so that you won't do the stuff that really does matter. It's called Vanity Fair. It's a fair. And it's all vanity. Vanity of vanities. Vanity means it's nothing. It's nothing. This is what happens to people who sleep. They might dream, and that's about it. And their dreams actually don't accomplish anything. You don't want to dream about someday I'll be a really good Christian. You don't want to dream about someday I'll actually become holy. I'll become more Christ-like. Someday I'll actually talk to somebody about Christ. Someday I'll actually do something that matters. That's a dream. Today's the day. You've been given today. Tomorrow's not promised. You've been given today. But if you're asleep, time to wake up. Say, Ooh, what am I doing? Am I busy about the master's business? Because there's a business. You go, well, I've, before I can do the master's business, I have to become qualified. And the way I get qualified is I got to get myself perfect before I can do the master's business. That is a, a delusion. Don't wait. Do what you can do today. You see, if you want to become an expert at something, like you want to be, let's say you want to be an expert golfer, golfing once won't do it. You go, but I golfed once and I was terrible at it. Golfing once won't do it. You've got to do it again and then again and again, and you will refine your skills as you keep doing. But if you don't do, you'll never be good at it. God says, do what you can do. When Moses came to the Red Sea, he goes, now what do I do? And God says, what's in your hand? Use that. Use the thing that you've got already. Oh, oh, the staff? Oh, yeah, okay, boom. C parts. Use what you have already. When you use what you have already, God will do great things with the little that you have. You got to turn over the little that you have into his hands so that he could do something big with it. But if you just hold it to yourself, it'll never go anywhere. It's the seed that is never sown. It's the bag of seeds. I got a whole bag of seeds in the back room. Well, you're going to die with just a bag of seeds if you don't plant them. There's a whole crop and a harvest that could happen if you just plant what you've got, right? When men sleep, we miss out. We'll wake up someday. Here's what happens. There's a lot of people, they wake up when they're old going, wow, now I look back on my life and realize I haven't really accomplished anything. Oh my gosh, I better get in a hurry here. You need to wake up right now. So this is what it says in Matthew 13, 24 through 25. Matthew 13, 24 through 25. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. You know when the enemy works greatest, most, hardest? When people are sleeping. You see, if the watchman is watching but falls asleep, there is no watchman. And, and the enemy can come in. You see, the watchman can be totally capable. He could be the best fighter on the whole team. He could be the, the soldier of soldiers. He could be the most powerful guy, the best shot with an arrow and all that stuff. The best sword fighter, he's the watchman on the wall protecting the city. But if he sleeps, he's useless. 
Well, I've got myself honed, you know, to this fine-tuned instrument for God. And I'm honing myself, and I'm going, I'm reading all these books and taking theology courses so that I can be finely tuned. But if you don't ever use it, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 says this, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Let us not sleep as others do. Do you know there's a lot of others? There's a lot of people sleeping. Do you know, when you're asleep, I'm going to tell you something. When I was a child, you see, when you're asleep, this is where your flesh is comfortable. Your flesh is comfortable when you're asleep. When I was sleeping as a child... The most horrible sound was an alarm clock. And in those days, alarm clocks, they, they didn't, like I now have my phone wakes me up to a nice little melody. Alarm clocks back then were like, eh, 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 eh. it was like, oh, oh, oh my gosh, the house is on fire. It was just annoying sound, but it wanted to get you out of bed, so they're going to make this terrible sound. But you know what? I didn't want to wake up. I was having a good dream. It was so cozy. I'm so warm and snuggled, and it's raining out, and I don't want to go out. I just don't want to go. I'd want to go back to sleep. Well, who wants to go back to sleep? Oh, your flesh. Your flesh says, I want to go back to sleep. Please don't bother me. Please, mom, don't wake me up. Hey, did you hear the alarm? You're supposed to get out of bed. Mom, just leave me alone, right? Well, Jesus, just leave me alone. I don't want to wake up because I'm cozy right now. I can just be my cozy life, and I'm enjoying it. I'm just dreaming every day about stuff. What are you accomplishing? Jesus said he came to do his Father's work. Jesus said he sent us to do the things that he did. He said, as, as I have been sent, so I send you likewise. Go and do it. Go and do what? You mean, I, can I just go to sleep? No, Jesus has a work for you to do. What is that work? You know what? You are an ambassador for Christ. You are an ambassador. You're a representative of the King of Kings. As a representative of, a king, of the King of Kings, does anybody around you recognize you as a true representative of his? Do they see in you a different kind of life? Do they see in you a different kind of talk? Do they see in you anything different, or do they not even notice you because actually you're asleep? Right? Let us not sleep as others do. Watching is something you can only do if you're awake. And Jesus said this, watch and pray. Oh, that's another thing. You know, I've known a few people who could do this. I haven't really experienced this. A few people can pray in their sleep, okay? Most of us have to be awake. I've met a few people who have awakened themselves praying in tongues. That's a cool thing. But most people, we don't pray usually while we sleep, okay? We need to be awake to pray because we're going to focus our attention on Jesus. We need to be awake to pray. And Jesus says, watch and pray. Well, prayer doesn't seem very active. I mean, you want me to get out there and do something. You know what? You won't know what to do if you don't get the commands from the commander, if you don't get the orders from the general. You need to go to him and get what to do and then do what he says to do. You see, Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear the Father saying. And we go, well, I don't see the Father doing anything because you're asleep. And I don't hear the Father saying anything because you're asleep. Wake up and pray. And say, Lord, what are you talking to me about today? What are you speaking to me today? Today we did a small exercise to get one word. You know, if you can get one word, I'm going to give you a revelation. You can get five words. All you do is ask for another one, and another one, and another one. This is how prophecy occurs. This is how um, even words of knowledge, this is how tongues happen, is you put out the first word and the next one shows up. A lot of people liken it to a Kleenex box. You know, you pull the tissue up, and the next one pops up. You don't pull the tissue up. It just stays where it's at. You pull it, the next one, the next one, the next one. I can't tell you how many times um, I've had, like, I remember this one time. I really had this weird word of knowledge at Seattle Center. But the words, as they were coming out of my mouth, each time they, I'm saying this, the next word is just coming out, coming out, coming out. I'm going, oh my gosh, did I really say that? Oh, I'm, I'm on a limb now. Oh, this is getting a stretching it, stretching it. I remember this one time, I've told this before, is 
I was with this friend. We were witnessing to people. We were praying for people in Seattle Center. And there were all these, there's a big bell there that's this Buddhist temple bell that's out in a courtyard. And there were all these young people, 20s, around the bell smoking pot. And I was with this person who used to go here named Julie. And we were praying for people. And I said, see all the people over there smoking pot? That's where we're going. She said, oh, no, we don't want to go there. I go, yeah, we're going to go there because the devil doesn't want us to go there. I know that. So that's why we're going there. So we went over to all these people smoking pot. And we're there, and we're talking. We say, hey, we pray for people. God heals them. And, and Julie, um, there's, this, there's this guy looking at us. He's kind of the ringleader. And Julie says, you know, I got a word from the Lord. And I go, oh, good. Share it. And she looks this guy in the head, and she goes, you want to rob us? And I'm going, oh, boy. You know, on guard. I'm ready. I'm ready for this. And he's like, he's like uh, 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 no, 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 that didn't cross my mind. You could tell he'd been caught, right? And so we began to pray for these people, and they were getting healed. And then this guy, the ringleader, I said to him, he said, so you got any pain in your body? He goes, no, I don't have any pain. I go, is there anything you need? He goes, I need a job. I go, well, can I pray for you for a job? And he goes, okay, pray for, pray for a job. So I put my hands on him, and I'm starting to pray for this guy. And uh, I get a word of knowledge. So a word comes to me. And it's like, oh, I don't want to say that. This guy's this rough guy, this tough guy. This guy you wouldn't, you know, a, a guy that you wouldn't want to mess with. And I get this word, masseuse. I said, what kind of job would you like? He goes, I don't know, any kind of job. I go, so I'm praying, I'm think, I get masseuse. And I go, I can't see this guy massaging people. It's just, a, I wouldn't let him massage me. You know, he, he'd, he'd probably bring something. And I get, so I just, I ignore it. It's a word from God, masseuse. And I'm ignoring it, and the Lord's like, masseuse. I go, okay. And I said to the guy, I said, let me tell you something. Is, I'm going to pray for your job thing, but I know this might sound weird, but here it goes. The Lord says, you're going to be a masseuse. And he goes, no way. I go, what? He goes, I've just been through massage school. <laughs> oh, that was God speaking. I had to step out of my comfort zone and step out on that word. And then he was convicted, like, that is God speaking. God's speaking to you. How would you know I was going to be a masseuse? Well, I wouldn't, believe me, never would have known. I had to step out in the danger zone. I had to get out there where it was a little bit scary, a little bit uneasy, like, oh, my gosh, he's going to thump me for this. You know, he's going to be upset with me. Like, what are you talking about? You know? No, it was God speaking. God could speak to you, and you need to step out on faith. And faith is this. That's the first step out of the boat. You take the first step out of the boat, you go, but what if I sink? Well, if you don't step out of the boat, I guarantee you, you'll never walk on water, so you might as well try it. You know, Peter did walk on water. People just give him a bad rap because he sunk. You know what it even says? It says that he was walking on the water, and he was looking at Jesus, and when he took his eyes off of Jesus, it didn't say he sank. It said he began to sink. Can you imagine? He didn't just go, Phew. He just started to do this, like, oh, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. <laughs> but he's the only one in the boat who can say, I actually walked on water. The rest of them chickened out, right? There's so many things God would like to do that are fantastic fabulous in your life, breakthroughs like you've never even thought God could do in your life, things where he wants to use you, where he said, I could never be used for it. There's so much stuff out there that's outside of your comfort zone. It's all outside of your comfort zone. Well, I don't know about all that stuff. Well, you know what? You want to know about that stuff? No, I don't want to know. You need to want to know about that stuff. You want to know what God wants you to do. You need to be open to hearing the voice of God, and you need to be open to taking a step. And you go, but that step could be scary. I know it's exciting. It's exciting. When you take a step for God, it's exciting. It's so exciting. So how am I going to hear the voice of God? Well, you got to wake up, and you got to begin to pray. Praying is something that is intentional. It's not just something you naturally do because you naturally lay on the couch. That's what you naturally do. And watch TV. That's natural. Prayer is something you have to be intentional about saying, I'm going to go to the Lord right now. And he says, go into your closet and shut your door. That means shut out the distractions. Right, man? 
Shut the door. There's not a whole lot going on inside your closet if you don't take your phone in there, right? It's just you and the clothes. That's it. Shut the door to your closet and pray to your Father, which is in heaven. Oh, that's, you know, but I'd rather sit on the couch. That's your flesh. Do you really want to make a difference? Well, you know, there's somebody in you, it's your spirit, somebody in you that really wants to make a difference. It's that one that Christ is one with. The you that Christ is one with wants to do great things through you. Oh, he can't do great things through me. I'm a nobody. You know what? You know, God has taken some real nobodies and done some magnificent things with their life because the life was yielded to him. Watch and pray. We need to pray. We need to wake up. We need to stir ourselves up. We need to pray. Okay? If we're asleep, the enemy can attack you. You realize when you sleep, you're vulnerable. When you're in this fog of dreamland, all kinds of stuff can happen around you. You're not even aware of it. You know, I've had times where actually I was in a dream and something was happening in real life. Some sounds were happening. And somehow my brain just incorporated those as part of the dream. So I didn't wake up. You know, I'm hearing this alarm or something. And it's like, I'm hearing an alarm in the dream. So I'm like, oh, I better go shut that off. Well, it won't shut off. That's because it was really happening. <laughs> There's an alarm going off. We can get in our dream life and think that's our real life. Your dream life's not your real life. It's your life in Christ where you're walking aware of his presence. That's the real life. That's the real life. You see, you have eternal life, but it's not talking about your body. It's not even talking about your, your soulish realm of living. It's talking about your spirit. Your spirit has eternal life. And your spirit, when Jesus said, you will, if you believe in me, you will never die, he's talking about your spirit. Because your body will probably die unless Jesus comes back before that. So your body's going to die. Oh my gosh, so it has an ending. Yes, it has an ending. Your spirit will live forever. And you know what will happen? I'm going to tell you the truth. This is what's going to happen to a lot of people. An awakening. A lot of people who have been saved and been in Christ for their whole lives are going to die and suddenly wake up and go, because their body's not there to tell them just rest, just take it easy, just dream on. They're going to wake up to the reality of the spirit realm and go, wow, have I wasted my time. Look at all the opportunities I missed to walk with God. I never knew all this was so real. I never knew it all existed because they spent their whole life sleeping. So it's better to wake up on this side. It's better to awaken yourself now. Awaken thou that sleepest. Stir yourself up. Put on your armor. Gird up your loins and go. This is what God wants us to do. You might say, well, you know, I'm getting towards retirement time, so I don't think I'm going to do much. You know what? In the spiritual realm, there is no retirement. There is no retirement from spiritual things. doesn't matter if you're young. You say, well, maybe I'm not old enough to go get a job. doesn't matter if you're young or old. You have within you potential to be used greatly of God. Little Samuel was a little boy. He was used greatly of God. Joseph was a young man, was used greatly of God. David was a young man when he was used greatly of God. Then there were these old men who didn't even get started. I mean, Moses didn't really start his whole thing about taking the children of Israel out of Egypt till he was 80 years old. You realize that? 80 years old. He started his ministry. Before that, he didn't have a ministry. All these people. Luke 12, 35, 36, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourself be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding that when he comes and knocks, they may open it immediately. It's talking about those who are waiting while they're awake. It says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. It means be aware, be awake, doing the father's business. Well, I'm not sure what the father's business is. You know what? There's a big picture out there. You could say, do, you know, like create Boeing. It's like, well, I'm not sure what Boeing's all about. I mean, I'm going to have to teach you all about airplanes and how airplanes fly and about parts. No, just start where God starts you. You say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Today. You don't have to have the big, big picture. You need to have the next step. And say, Lord, if you will just give me one step, I'll take that step. Whatever you want me to do, I'll take that step. Even if it's a step that is on the other side of my comfort zone, I'll just do it. I'll just do it. Lord, I'm going to wake up 
and I'm going to begin to pray. And I'm going to begin to pray so that I can hear. I'm not going to begin to pray as in, okay, I'm going to start praying now, and here it goes. Lord, I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that, I need that. There, I prayed today. I'm done now. No, half a prayer, at least, should be more than half, is listening. Lord, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to call? I remember one time I had come home from work, and the Lord told me, this, back in the days of dial-up phones, I know some of you have never seen one, <laughs> dial-up phone, didn't have cell phones, no cell phones, phone was plugged into the wall, had to be powered by the wall, yes, it's, I know it's a totally different world. So I, I got home from work one day, and the Lord said, call my friend Al, he says, call Al now. So I dialed the phone, you dialed. I dialed the phone, I dialed his number, I picked up the phone, I dialed it, and then I'm waiting for the ring. Then it would go ring, ring. You'd hear that. There was no ring ever. It was just quiet. And I'm going, where's the ring? And then I heard this voice go, so, is somebody on the line? And I go, yeah, is somebody on the line? Yeah. I go, who is this? He goes, it's Al. And I go, Al? Al? He goes, yeah. I go, did your phone ring? He goes, no, I just picked up my phone. I was about to make a call, and somebody was online. It was you. The timing was so perfect when he picked up the line, and when I dialed the call, that in a split second, before it had a chance to ring, he had picked it up, that we were both on the line at the exact same time, because the Lord told me to call him then. You see, God has a timing, and his timing is perfect. And he knows exactly when you should sow this seed in the right season so that this seed can produce a great crop in a later season. He knows exactly what you should do today that will build on for what he's going to do tomorrow. He knows exactly what step you need to get today so that you can end up on that long journey in the destination he decided for you long ago. But if you don't listen, if you don't wake up, if you don't pray, if you don't ask, and if you aren't willing to take a step... You're just like one that sleeps. In this whole life, you could sleep it away. Sleep it away. It says that the lazy man in the Proverbs is like a door on its hinges. And you see, the door on the hinges, the door never, re the door never moves away from the doorway. It's stuck there by the hinge. So all a lazy man does is does this in bed. It's like a door on its hinges. That's all he does. He doesn't get out of bed. But God wants us to get unhinged. <laughs> he wants us to get out of bed out of our comfort zone, and begin to say, Lord, here I am. Use me. All right. Well, I got through two pages today, so. But the Lord knows what he's doing. The Lord's speaking to us. He's saying, I want my church to wake up. I want my church to wake up. And you know what? There's part of you that doesn't want to wake up. We understand that. But let's... Let's let that other part of us rule the spirit that says, I want to wake up. Let's let that part be the boss, not our flesh. And let's say, Lord, I don't want to wake up right now. I want to begin to look at the things you're looking at, to desire the things you desire, to do the things you want me to do, because, Lord, I want my life to count. I want to have a reward. I want to hear a well done when I get to see you in heaven. Not like, what were you doing, but a well done good and faithful servant. All right, so we're going to stop right there. If there's anybody here today who has not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you haven't asked him to come into your heart and save you, if you've never done that, this is the day to do that. There is no better day than today. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts if you hear his voice. Is there anybody here who has never asked the Lord to come into their heart and save them right now? Raise your hand. We're going to pray with you. Anybody at all? All right, then let's just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is life, your word is truth, and your word is good. It's our treasure, Lord. We thank you, Father, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, lives within us. And Lord, we want to now become the people who follow that spirit. We don't want to be those that follow after the flesh, but those that follow after the spirit, because they are truly the sons and daughters of God. So Lord, today, we rouse ourselves up. We wake ourselves up. We stir ourselves up right now, Lord. And we say, Lord, our eyes are opening right now. We see Jesus, and we say, Lord, what would you have us to do? 
In Jesus' name, speak, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.